Hey, welcome back to Spirit Music Meetups. Mike Burris here. We're in this series where we're pulling on this thread and looking really at the original languages. You know, the Bible wasn't written in English. There's a lot lost in translation. Uh, look at the Bible Info tab I'll put up here. And uh, there's 900 translations. Which one are you going to read? I've looked at so many of them, 55 and compared it to the Greek, and there's just so much left out because they're trying to save print space. You know, agathos, God, only God is good. That, that word is, you know, wow, 17 words in English to try to describe one word. So I don't think the word good is going to come very close. Uh, kalos, we saw in the last video, is another word for good for like good soil, the good soil that we have to be. And that, that's kalos, is, is again, takes a lot of words to explain, not as many as agathos, but it's, uh, you know, like when, you, when you're a gardener, when you look at sow, you can tell if it's good soil or not for that plant. There's different soils for different plants. So we were pulling on a string, and in the last video, we really came to the conclusion that we have to be habitually, as a lifestyle, routinely filled with, um, with all the fullness of God. And that was from Ephesians chapter 3. And Paul talks about this quite a bit. I think that's 3.19. Ephesians 3.19. Yeah, if you want to know the love of God, the love of Christ that far surpasses, you know, hyperbolically surpasses knowledge, informational knowledge, which he's definitely attacking the rabbis, which just had scripture knowledge, and also the Greeks who had philosophical knowledge and scientific knowledge. So he's really, you know, attacking them all, because this letter was originally written for all of the places that Paul visited. It wasn't just for Ephesus. We know that from looking at the older manuscripts versus the new manuscripts. So, you know, ended up in Ephesus and they probably wanted to claim Paul, you know, claim to fame. Hey, wait, Paul sent this to us. So they said, the, you know, the later manuscripts said to the, Ephes to the church in Ephesus. So it says, why, why is this important? Ephesians 3.18 uh, Paul's praying for them that they might, you know, fully understand, comprehend, uh, pull down from above and grab for themselves. Catalambano means, you know, pull down from above and, and, and own it, really grab a hold of it for themselves. With all the saints that he's writing to, not just uh, this church, wherever it ends up. Uh, so that they might under all, understand all the dimensions, you know, he's, he's talking like the height and the width and the breadth and the length of the love of Christ, right? That's what he's really talking about. This is what matters to Paul, and it should matter to us. It, and that's what we found in the previous videos. It's all about love. It's all about love. It, it's all about love. That's, that's why it's so why we're going down this path. We've been pulling on the string for several parts. And we're just allowing the Lord to speak to us, and we're digging into what He's shown Paul and others. So, to know this surpassing knowledge of, 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 the, of the love of Christ that far surpasses informational knowledge, in order that you may be filled Unto, now that's, that's not a good English word, I'm sorry. Ice means, as we saw, 1519, you can click. I'm looking at Bible Hub, great tool. Also, uh, a great tool is Classic Net Bible. And you can click on these Greek words, and you'll see that ice is a preposition. And it uh, means motion into which you penetrate or uh connect or make union. So you know that branch we started, uh, John 15, must connect, meno, connect into the vine and remain connected. That's meno. But it has to connect into the vine, which is Christ. We have to connect to Christ. 
It starts, but it must continue. And so that connection, that union, that is a penetration. And that is the purpose or result of this motion. So see, there's so much in the Greek words. So that you may be filled, and that means completely to the brim. It's a plero. Filled to the brim, not just a little bit, but filled to the brim, right up to the top. And that's that motion toward, toward what? Penetrating into or making union with what? The fullness. What? All the fullness. The whole, the entirety of the fullness. Pleroma is the complete fullness of the God, not one of their other gods. And he says that in Ephesians 3.19. But then he goes off and he talks about some things like Paul often does, a little side argument. And then he comes back in Ephesians 5.17 and he says, I don't want you to be foolish. You know, don't be foolish in these times. But instead, understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, he doesn't tell them what the will of the Lord is because in most of the New Testament, it's not explicitly stated. Why? Because it's not the Old Covenant wrote out the will of God. 613 commandments. In the New Covenant, he's not going to do that. But we try to do that. We can't do that to the New Covenant. Because Acts chapter 2, verse 17 and 19 explains what the way of God's communication is. Not the only place, but that's a good place to look. The way God's going to communicate in the last days is through prophecy, even dreams and visions. And that's how he's going to speak to his servants. These are not so-called Christians, churchgoers. These are God's servants. So, you know, I'm, I want to serve. I want to follow. I want to be God's slave. That's what servant means. So, sunini, this understanding is the verb of connecting the dots, putting things together to come to a conclusion. Now, in the world, the so-called understanding ones, that's, that's like the rabbis, right? They understand God. Oh, yeah, they really know. Jesus said they don't know anything about God. So that connecting the dots, right, this takes time. Connecting the dots, what the will of the Lord is. In other places, Paul uses the word dokumizo, which means to investigate or to look deeply into. Kind of a Sherlock Holmes. But Sherlock Holmes put the facts together, the clues together, and he drew conclusions. But you can see that's how we get the word discern. It means to scrutinize, to investigate, to look deeply into to discover for yourself, to discover what the will of the Lord is. So I have a whole link on that under knowledge. You can go look at that. And also the Logos Word of God is not explicitly stated. It's the message of God is not is a person. And we're supposed to be interacting with that person. So he says in Ephesians 5.18, So... Why is he saying all this? you got to understand the will of God. Don't be a fool. Don't waste your life. Do not be drunk. This is his imperative. This is his strong urging. I don't want you to be drunk by the means of wine, in which is presently and ongoingly debauchery, which is wasteful living. It's a waste. You're, you're getting wasted, and you end up wasting your life. You get wasted, and you're wasting your time. You're wasting your life. So that's not the way to find God's will in a bar. But he says instead, but instead, this is a huge contrast. He's saying, strongly urging again, using the imperative, to present and presently and ongoingly become. This is done to them. It's not something they can do themselves, but become filled. That's that up to the brim thing again. With the, it's not with, that's, that's not correct. It's by the means of the Spirit. There's been some great scholarly work on the use of the preposition N 
be in, can be mean in, by, or with, right? That's the choices, in the location of, by the means of, or with the company of. But every time it's used with the word pneumati, pneuma, spirit, it's always refer in the singular, it's always referring to the Holy Spirit, and it's always referring to by the means of the Spirit. This is how we become filled to the brim, right? To the brim, reaching and penetrating into the fullness of God. Wow. This is what Paul's saying. You got to get. We can see how he came back to his original thought. He's coming back, Ephesians 5.18. And now, and then he says, this is what's going to happen. There's five participles. Participles are descriptive phrases, adjectives, uh, acting, right? acting as adjectives, describing who they are, what's going to happen. He's talking to them, plural, these Christians, to be filled by the Spirit, by the means of the Spirit, and then, often like he does, he describes who these people are. He does this all the time. And he's talking about this new kind of party that, they, that these people are going to have. Not the party in the tavern getting wasted and wasting their life. And it's speaking to each other, and literally it means speaking, laleo, addressing one another, speaking to one another. So they're... There's a lot of speakers in the early church. There's not one speaker. This is not one, this one side, a one hat, you know, one hat guy. Romans 12, 3 says, you know, no man should think more highly of himself than he ought. And then he talks about the body of Christ. Everybody functioning, everybody working together. So you got these people who want to be speakers, but he's saying speaking to each other. Literally, they're teaching one another. How? By the means, there's that N again, by the means of psalms, which are instrumental music with lyrics or not. And, and they had that in the Old Testament, so a lot of these are Jews. And hymns, which are a cappella, no instruments. And also songs, all right, and then they use this adjective, spirit kind. Well, that means the others are not necessarily spirit kind. They were composed by men and, you know, inspired by God's psalms, but hymns, maybe not, maybe not, maybe not inspired by God, maybe not channeled by God, maybe not prophecy. And so, spirit kind of songs. Well, we know what spirit kind of songs are from 1 Corinthians 14, 14 through 15, where Paul says that when he speaks or, or uh, prays, right, or sings by the means of the Spirit, he's referring to tongues, supernatural prayer language and praise language, you know, because it says, what is tongues? It's giving praise and thanksgiving and high praise, and high thanksgiving to God. And so we talked a little bit about that in the last, and there's, there's a link that you can go to on tongues and really discover this for yourself. And then he uses another participle, singing, and linked to this, making melody in your heart, in your heart, to the Lord. So these are a phrase, singing and making melody in your heart unto the Lord, is really describing the previous phrase, psalms, hymns, and spirit kind of songs. These are spontaneous, by the Holy Spirit songs, in the Holy Spirit's language. The others were in your own language, if you're singing. So then he gives another participle, giving thanks. He's still describing, because it's plural, the, the, the subject is plural. Um, you all, giving thanks at all times, for all things, Wow, you think he got his point across? In the name, that's the authority of the Lord of us, Jesus Christ, to the God and Father of us, Jesus. Okay, so you see that we're giving thanks in the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ, the Lord of us. He's the master of us, 
and we're giving thanks to God and Father, the God and Father, our God and Father, but also God and Father of Jesus Christ. So you can read it different ways. And there is finally another participle. Y'all be submitting yourself to one another in reverence of Christ. And that reverence is the word phobos, where we get fear, phobia. So it's this, uh, it's not a terror of the Lord. It's a respect, an awe, an admiration, a love. You know, we, we, we are in love with Christ. The whole, remember, the whole thing's talking about the love of Christ. Ephesians 3, uh, 17, 18, 19 was talking about the love of Christ. Be submitting yourselves, yielding to one another. So now this is not what goes on in a bar. There's a lot of talking over each other. <clears throat> Boy, there's a lot of self-centeredness. And there's brawls. There's fights. People arguing. And there's people get killed in bars. And so this is a different kind of party. This all leads us back to what the Lord was showing me in this dream. That we need to, like a plant, be watered deeply by the Holy Spirit. We saw that in the last that he, the Holy Spirit is the living water. It's the water that gives, gives us genuine life. And we got to get our roots down deep. So we, I'm right now, I'm trickle, trickle watering a plant. So while I'm in here, it's going really deep so the, that the roots follow that water down deep. And that's how you really will produce great fruit. And that's what we need to do. We need to... I'm talking to myself. I'm preaching to myself here. We need to drink the water deeply. The living water, and we saw that in the last, it's the Holy Spirit, the last video, is the Holy Spirit. And that's this filling up to the brim until we are just filled up to the brim with all the fullness of God. Wow, don't we want the abundant completeness of God to play aroma? Wow, and, and we do this by the means of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus talks about this living water that will gush up, will leap up out of us, so that we never will have to, we'll never have an empty well. That's what he says. You'll never be thirsty again. That, that's re referring to, you know, the, like the thirst in the desert, you know, desperation emptiness you're about to die you're light you're just ready to die and you got to go find water somewhere in the desert you got to find water or you're going to die and he says you, you'll never have to worry about that again if you go for me the messiah i'm going to give you and he's talking and he and he says in john 7 38 he's referring to the holy spirit that was going to be given after he raised from the dead he had to raise from the dead to give the good gift of the Holy Spirit, he told them, you've got to wait in Jerusalem. I think that there's a lot of Christians that are in between. They became Christians. They became followers of Christ. They became disciples. But they haven't got to the day of Pentecost yet. I was one of them for a long time. Church of Christ. And I searched and searched for, I think, about three years I did not have that experience. And then I, I had the experience two years later again, and then I've had it many more times. So there's a link out, out there on my baptism of the Holy Spirit um, and my experiences with it. So it's repeated. We found that this filling by the Holy Spirit is a habitual lifestyle. That's what he's calling them to. And we see through the book of Acts, the same group of Christians getting filled by the Spirit the same over and over and over. It's the same group of Christians and others being added to that group. That's interesting. And so some people we see five times being filled by the Spirit and Peter filled and da -da -da, filled by the Spirit. But this is the same group. And the disciples were all filled by the Spirit and spoke boldly. You know, so it's the same group of people and others being added to the church. So this is something that we are pulling on the string of. 
how do we get filled by the Spirit? See, that was the question on the last video. And this filling by the means, it's not filling with the Spirit. You're really being filled with God. Well, the Spirit is God. You could say God is the Spirit. So you're fill, filled by the fullness of God, right? The pleroma of God. That's really what you're filled with. I, ice means toward and reaching and penetrating into the fullness of God. So it's kind of like the glass is filling up unto and reaching the fullness of God. And how is that glass filling up? Well, Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit bubbling up within you like a fountain, like an artesian well, a well, a, a, a hole in the ground, you know, a deep hole in the ground that is being fed by a spring. And a spring just keeps, and this spring is going to eternal life. It just keeps going. It will never end in, until you get to eternal life. So we really want to look at that. And he also, yep, that's what we want to look at. So let's pull on that string. And I'm going to pause it for a second. It's very interesting. I got very thirsty all of a sudden. And so I reached for the water. Now, so when Jesus said you will never thirst again, it's not talking about, you know, hey, I, I need some water. I was a little thirsty. I was a little thirsty. You know, that word there is like on death's door thirsty. Like you're going to die out in the wilderness if you don't get water thirsty. So, again, English kind of really dropped the ball, right? It really dropped the ball. So you want to look at things in Bible Gate, or not Bible Gateway. You want to look at things in Bible Hub in Classic Net Bible, I think those are two of the easiest tools. There's others out there. And some charge you. But, man, I feel much better, right? And that's what I believe Paul was trying to tell us, is that you're going to feel much better if you keep drinking from the Holy Spirit. So in Bible Gateway, in the English Standard Version, I'm going to look at drink. I'm going to look at the word drink see what happens. I'm going to look at the word drink and spirit, typing that in the search box. English Standard Version is, is a version that I used in five Bible colleges. It's very succinct and it's been used for doctrine, but again, it's, it's limited too. They're all limited. 900 translations are very limited. So this is I just saw that for the kingdom of God, Romans 14, 17, is not a matter of eating and drinking. And the context is they, the Jews had all these dietary laws. And they, there was Christians that coming out of Judaism and also, and they come to faith. And they, they know that they don't have to follow these rules anymore. But there are new Christians coming out of Judaism that still feel like they need to follow these dietary laws. And Paul calls them weak in faith, but he's telling the strong in faith, hey, don't beat them up. It's not very loving to do this. You need to help them. <laughs> it takes a while to come to the knowledge of the truth that will set you free. It's not an overnight thing, so love them in the process. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. You see, they were told by the Jews, hey, the kingdom of God is about these dietary laws and also holidays and all these rituals and sacrifices of animals and all this thing. But he's saying, hey, it's not a matter of eating and drinking, so let's not just keep going on and on about this discussion. Uh, you know, you can, you can kind of do what they're doing, just, you know, not make them feel out of place. You, that's, that's a loving thing to do. And, but of righteousness and peace, so righteousness is what the Jews are all concerned about, and that's what they believe the law will give to them, but it doesn't, it turns out. And peace, and joy, it's all linked. Righteousness and peace and joy, it's all linked in the Greek. It's not separate ideas. They're all integrated. Why? Because it turns out it's all by the means of the Holy Spirit. 
it's not in the Holy Spirit. It's by the means of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, gives you righteousness, peace, and joy. So, Romans 14, 17. Again, it's by the means of the Holy Spirit. And all... So, for they drank from the spiritual rock. Okay. Yeah, back in, you know, in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, they're talking about in the Old Testament, water came out of a rock, and all the Jews drank from that rock, and that rock actually was symbolic of Christ, Jesus. That rock was Christ. And that water was the living water. It was, you know, there's a lot of shadows and symbols and figures and things that were done in the Old Testament that point forward into the New Testament. So you always have to go from the New Testament back to the Old Testament. Don't go the other direction. Because the old, the other is a shadow. The Old Testament is a shadow. And why do we want to build doctrine on shadows? You're going to get in real trouble. You're going to, the substance is Christ. The reality is Christ. That's what the New Testament says. And uh, so we shouldn't be all... Like, woo look at these shadows. And I hear all these preachers just going crazy about these shadows. Whoa, look at this wonderful shadow. And they spent all their time talking about the shadow in, instead of the reality or the substance. Oh, uh, boy. For, so they drank from the spirit kind of rock. This is, this is that's actually, that, that followed them. And it, yeah, Christ... Christ was actually following them in the whirlwind. He was God, right? Following them everywhere. Okay, so now this is important. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For in one spirit we were all baptized. It's not in one spirit. It's by the means of one spirit we were baptized. That means immersed through water, baptism, Always meant that. Jews always knew that. Baptizo. For in or for by the means of one spirit, that's in numati, mano uh, numati, in mano numati, we were all immersed through water baptism into one body, one body of Christ. Jews and Greeks, slaves are free, and all were made. So that and chi could mean, and subsequently, or as a result, all were made to drink of one spirit. There we go. We were all made to drink of one spirit. Yeah, that's the Holy Spirit that happens in water baptism. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. And... Just putting that in Bible Hub, hitting the interlinear button, and we can see that we were made, aorist, past tense, when we were baptized. It's uh, potizo, which means I cause the drink or give the drink to irrigate, to water, being fed like with water or fed like even with milk. You know, when you're a baby, given to drink, to furnish drink, to make to drink. So, to saturate or imbue. So, you're made to drink, caused to drink. So, you were caused to drink. And this was done to you. It's in the passive. So, I don't know if you, you caught that in the English. But we were caused, we were made, it was done to us to drink, all of us, all of who? Those who were baptized into one body by the means of one spirit. That one spirit is what made us to drink one, you know, sorry, we were made to drink one spirit. We were brought that in, we imbibed it, it came into us, the Holy Spirit dwells in us, and... We are now one body of Christ. So, wow, that's that's good to know. So, let's ask the Lord, where do we go from this? So, we, in the baptism, we drank in the Holy Spirit. And it was aorist, it was a, 
happened in our past when we were baptized, and this made us one body. And where can we go from this, Lord? This is where we listen. Ah, let's see what Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit. And I believe, I remember this came into my mind, in Luke 13, is Luke 13, no, I'm sorry, Luke 11, Luke 11, sorry, Luke 11 is the Lord's Prayer recorded by Luke, who was a follower of Paul, he was, he was just a doctor, he wasn't, so he's just giving an account of what he heard from others. So he probably is interviewing a lot of people, and he recorded this. So the Lord gives the, he says, teach us how to pray, and he gives this prayer model to his disciples. And we know it. Father, hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come. And he goes through this, and he talks about persevering in prayer. Now this is important. So you're asking for the kingdom of God. You're praising the Lord. That's hallowed be your name. It's just like just you're in worship. You worship the Lord, and then you start asking. You ask your kingdom come, not, oh, I want to, yeah, let's get down to my daily needs here, or my, da my daily wants. Oh, I really want, you know, a Mercedes Benz. Oh, right, it's not done. Because, he says, let's talk about first, God's priorities, His kingdom, and in other versions it says, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And then he says, give us our daily bread. Alright, so now he gets them to physical needs. Alright, so we, God's priorities, worship. Then His will, which is His will be done, His kingdom, His reign as a king on earth as it is in heaven. And that's what we should be asking for. Then finally we get to our own personal needs. But a lot of people say, I don't think he's talking about our personal needs. Because a lot of places, when it talks about daily bread and not living on bread alone, but on every rhema word that comes from the mouth of God, and that Jesus is the bread of life, and we are supposed to be totally focused on Jesus. Jesus is our bread of life. And so, shouldn't we be asking for the bread of actual, real life, which is Jesus Christ, which is really about the kingdom. So it's really a continuation of thy kingdom come. How do we, how, how does Jesus, how does his kingdom come? It comes through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the king, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. So he is our daily bread that we can live on. And, and, and Jesus says over and over and over, don't work for bread that, don't strive, don't work, don't, why, why pray for it then? Why pray for bread that doesn't last? But he says, pray for genuine bread. I am the genuine bread of life. This is what you ought to want and work for. This is what you should be traveling around for. This Come after me, not for the bread that I'm going to give you, this physical bread. You should be coming after me. You need to eat of me. He even says that to his disciples. A lot of people got offended and they left. Wow, I don't want to eat of you. That means take, you got to really partake of me. I'm it, man. And that's what Paul says. I will not know anything except Christ, Christ and him crucified. I won't, I won't talk about anything. I won't recognize anything in my mind. And then he gets finally to forgive us our sins, because we, we have a guilt. We really have a lot of guilt, and it really blocks our relationship with God, and we got to get rid of it. So he says, just confess your sins. That's what 1 John uh, 1, 9, and 10 talks about, right? Just get rid of your sin. Just give it to him. Forgive us our sins, as we, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. So you can't ask God for something that you're not willing to give to others. So we need to get rid of our unforgiveness of others. You know, this is a big problem in all our relationships. Relationships are part, really, key of the kingdom. 
So we got to get our relationship with God right, forgive us our sins, cleanse us from our sins and our unrighteousness. And it, in 1 John 1, 9 and 10, talks about just getting rid of it all and just leave it there with Jesus. Jesus, that's why he came. Just leave it with Jesus, get rid of it, get right with God, then get right with everybody else by forgiving them. And, and the two go hand in hand. And it says, and lead us, it doesn't say, and lead us not into temptation. That's not what the Greek says. So this English is just poor, 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 poor. It's not, and lead us. It's not lead us, and lead us. God does not tempt. He says God cannot be tempted, nor does he tempt anyone else. So how is he going to lead us into temptation? That's just terrible. It's Luke 11.4. Let's get this solved, okay? Let's go look at the original language. And, but deliver us from the evil one. Really, it's singular. It's not evil plural. Uh, it says, and in possibility, so we're praying, if in all possibility, <coughs> God definitively erased lead, that's ice, pharaoh, ice we know means toward and penetrating or making union with, right, toward making union with, and pharaoh means, <coughs> the word pharaoh, not pharaoh the, the king, means to bear or carry, to bear or carry, habitually bear or carry. Oh, that's for A.O. That's another word, sorry. Uh, it means to bear or carry. All right, so to bury or carry, forward to penetrate into, to reach the result of something. So they say ice pharaoh means to, it means to bring, there's a carry, bring or carry, right, unto, making union with or into something. So bring or carry or to bear. So he, we're asking God to not bring or carry us to make contact with what? Not to bring or make contact with us. Okay? Unto that, that's that ice again, so he's really using this ice thing unto reaching the union of what? Is it temptation? Well, it looks like this word pyrosmos, pyrosmos, is, it can mean either one. So context and the understanding the nature of God and, and the other verses that talk about God does not tempt anybody. So we know it cannot mean temptation. So words are defined by the use of the author. So we could go look at Pyrismos in all of Luke and see how he uses it. But also, also you got to know who he's talking about. God does not tempt anyone. It says that everywhere. But he does test. So that word test both senses can apply sim simultaneously depending on the context. So the context is everything. The positive sense is test, and the negative sense is temptation. And it's defined by context. It says this right here. It really means an experiment, an attempt. This is the common use, an experiment, an attempt, a trial to prove something to prove something the trial of man's fidelity his integrity his virtue his constancy uh, this is a trial of God by men it's to find out what you're made out of it's to prove what you're made out of and we're praying God I don't want to go through trials and troubles right tribulation, persecution. The Christians were going through a lot of this. So he's saying, don't bring us to this. You know, if in all possibility, 
you know, I want to learn from you directly. I want to learn, you know, humbly. I want to learn as a son. I don't want to have to learn through troubles. You know, a lot of people don't learn from other people. They they have to kind of what the what do they call the uh, they learn by hard knocks or how's that go? You know what I'm saying? They they learn by trial by by doing by going through troubles and they go oh I'll never do that again <laughs> you know I remember when I got this comes right into my head when I first bounced the check when I was first learning got a job and I wasn't watching my account and I wrote a bad I wrote a check and there wasn't enough money and I got dinged so many times by the time I realized what was going on I had like $125, $25 of insufficient fees. And uh, I think I pleaded with the bank manager and I only had to pay one of them, $25. So, but wow, it was a painful experience. It was a trial. It was a tribulation. It wasn't a temptation. I mean, I, I already had written the bad checks. I was already tempted. So it's not about that. It was this, I had to learn a lesson to keep a checkbook with a running balance. So I knew at all times, after, if all the checks cleared, how much money would be in my account. And I wasn't doing that. And I learned, I learned that lesson the hard way. So that's what I mean. Some people don't learn their lessons except by the hard way. But we're saying, God, you know, we don't want that. We don't want that. If at any possibility, teach me. I open my ears that I might hear. Open my eyes that I might actually really see to understand. Open my heart that I will understand and feel what you're trying to say. And so then Jesus said, boy, we got a little off here, but that's that's upsetting. That that English translation is using something that doesn't fit. So, hey, you got to look outside of these English translations. And Jesus said to them, which of you, now he's going to really press this idea of perseverance. Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. See, they, they had little small houses, so you could hear from bed. You could hear from the bed. I tell you, though, he will not get up. He will not get up and give him anything. Um, though, I'm sorry. I tell you, though, he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend. He already said. Yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. Now, that sounds very negative. Because of it. Is impudence? You see, this translation is saying that, you know, how dare you? So let's go look at uh, Luke 11, 8. Luke 11, 8. It's really the Greek word because of his persistence. It's anadea. It's like a shameless persistence. <laughs> Almost like he's in greed. But it, it just means uh, he's not ashamed. He's shameless. He's desperate. <laughs> it, maybe he should have been doing that at midnight, you know. Uh, it's unembarrassed. It's not, you know, he, it's not a negative thing. He's just unembarrassed. He has unembarrassed boldness. Okay, so now that, see how that makes a lot more sense. Because of his unembarrassed boldness, his friend will rise from the bed and give him whatever he needs. Now, he's saying this, and I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. So he's using that to illustrate that you, you, you need to persevere. And you need to have unashamed, unembarrassed boldness. When you come to the Father, there's a, we find in a lot of writings, there's all kinds of evil battles going on. It takes a 
quite a long time sometimes for angels to get to you through the fierce battle that is going on in the heavenly realms, in the spiritual realm, right around us, right now. I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Now, it just sounds like in English that he's just saying, hey, you know, I asked. I hear people say, oh, look, you know, I don't believe in God anymore because I asked for my mom. You know, I asked one time. I pleaded with God for my mom to get better, and she ended up dying. And it will be given. And I sought that, and I knocked on the door, and it will be open to you. Now, in I think a lot of Americans are just they, you know, fast food. They want it right now, and if they don't get it, they kick and scream and cry, and they say, "Well, I'm never going to go back to that restaurant." Right? That's what they do, and they do that with God. But I know. Christians in, in um, Asia, personally, I support some missionaries. They they do not get they do not take no because they know there's a spiritual battle going on. It's not God's fault for not showing up right then and there, and we don't know what else God is trying to do by your perseverance of prayer. Prayer, right? We don't know. So if you don't persevere in prayer, then you will never see uh, the result, and your faith. Your, your faith goes out the window. But they do. They don't take no for an answer. They pray until you're healed. Because they know that there is a war. And they have to fight the good fight. And, and we are wimps. They see miracles. Man, they see miracles. Usually within three weeks to a month. And bam, they see divine healings. People that have cancers, no cancer. Gone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. They see epilepsy. They see demon possession. It's all demonic. All the sickness is all demonic. And you're fighting war. You know, Ephesians 6, warfare. We give up. And Jesus is saying, don't give up. Wow, I don't have, Let's look at it in the Greek. This is important, Lord. It's telling us something about something coming up. I feel it. Do you feel it? <laughs> Do you feel it? 